Hi. Um, I'm excited to be here and, uh, and present with you all today. Um, I, Adrian did a wonderful job, and I'm excited to have uh, Fred here, too. Um, we actually are part of the Greater Richmond Trauma-Informed Community Network, and really is about really, I mean, I have court-involved youth, but um, because usually that's how I meet a lot of clients and, and stakeholders. But honestly, uh, the research that I'll be showing you shows us that this is really becoming almost the new vital sign um, of the community. Um, there are about 224 million people in the United States, adults, impacted um, by what we call adverse childhood experiences. And so things that I'm going to talk to you today will hopefully show the relevance um, to educators, um, to attorneys, guardian ad litems, defense attorneys, judges, juvenile justice, detention, um, public mental health, private mental health providers, um, uh, child welfare workers. We've done a lot of work with uh, local departments of social services recently. Um, and so it really is about creating, hopefully in Virginia, no wrong door. Um, and that we do not um, end up re-traumatizing uh, children that come into our systems. Um, or the adults who were once children in our system. So um, the short version of me is I'm really into trauma, pretty passionate about it. And, um, and I actually grew up in my career in the juvenile justice system, um, but spent time working in correctional facilities, detention facilities, setting up post-dispositional programs, um, also spent a lot of time uh, working inside of a crisis acute, ho acute hospital settings, residential placement settings. I worked in child protective services for a while, as well as adult protective services. And um, while in detention, I think all of us probably sit here for a particular child or a case that perhaps moved us um, to be in this profession. And, and I have certainly a lot of those, but one of them um, that sticks with me, and the reason I actually went on my journey to get my PhD was I had um, a seven-year-old client who I met her when she was seven. She was in her eighth foster care placement, hopefully her adoptive placement. Um, she had been kicked out of all of the elementary schools, all of the alternative ed programs, and every after-school program in the city that I met her in. And the day I met her, she just finished doing $3,000 of damage to her new home. And she was about to go back into a hospital again and the problem when kids go into institutional settings, whether it's detention or correctional or a mental health institution, is that's who they become attached to. So when I worked into the detention facilities, um, sometimes I would have some of my kids visit me 13 times a year. And they'd be like, hey, Ms. Allison, what's up? And I was like, that's great, but you're not supposed to be seeing me here again this soon, right? But oftentimes, that was the place they felt the safest. It was where they got their health care needs met. It was where they were often safe and not um, in very violent communities. Um, it's where people cared for them, and it's where they knew they got fed three times a day. So this young lady, we didn't want her to go back in a hospital setting. We actually uh, had a program called the Virtual Residential Program. A team, myself and six others, worked in her home 80 hours a week to keep her stabilized in her home and get her back into a traditional school setting. And um, this child went from literally tearing apart a home to we went to, one of the things I'll talk about today is we know bilateral movement in the brain actually helps the brain calm down and get to a place of focus where a child can learn. So um, the, what's the worst thing for someone who's had trauma in their brain is actually times of transition. And in an educational setting or a juvenile detention setting, there's a whole lot of transition all the time. And so what was happening is when she would go to school, she'd go into overload, and she would really act out, and she couldn't make it past the first 30 minutes of school. And so they would put her out of school. And so what we did is I actually would walk her to school every day. It was about a mile and a half. Um, I was pretty out of shape, so what she didn't know is I would walk her to school and then have someone pick me up to take me back to my car. <laughs> but we walked to school every day, and it was funny because people in the community came out and said, hey, do you know we have a busing system here? And I'm like, yeah, I got it. We're choosing to walk to school. And, um, and she would walk, and one day when we were walking, she said, you know what I'm like? I'm kind of like Gaddafi. So I have a seven-year-old telling me she's a terrorist. And she says, I know you're trying to get close to me, but I'm trying to protect people, because if you get close to me, I'll destroy you. And, and I'm thinking, this is this seven-year-old, and this is what she believes about herself. And what happened after walking with her day after day to school, she started being really successful in school, because all that anxiety, we worked through it before she got to the classroom, but she started being really successful. Um, eventually, she was a sexually reactive child. She'd been sexually abused by 15 different members of her family, um, termination of parental rights. 
and um, she was on a risk safety plan. Mom stepped out of the room. She touched her three-year-old brother. None of us knew about it. She began to have empathy from therapy, and she told on herself. And she said, I touched my brother. It was wrong. I feel bad about it. I don't know how to handle this. She was immediately removed from her home, placed in an institutional setting. And when the adoptive parents asked for her back, they were in the process of adoption, and said, we can do this, um, DSS said no. Um, you can't have her back. She's too high of a risk. She lost her adoptive family, and I got to go in with the mom and tell her that she wasn't getting adopted. And her response to me at 7 was, you've taught me so much. Um, she would gotten back into school. She was down to five hours of therapy a week. She's like, you've taught me so much, and you taught me to take responsibility for my behavior, to tell when I'd done something wrong, but you forgot to tell me the secrets that can lose you a family. And that was the moment I signed up for the PhD program to figure out how the system could do it better. Sadly, her story goes on to she was eventually put back into a therapeutic foster care placement, and an, an older adult sibling reoffended against her, um, and she was placed in an adult institutional setting, to which I believe that she is still there. So usually most of us have a story. You have the stories that make you do this work because you see them in the community and you're like, yes. And then you have the stories that break your heart. Um, and I think that that's when I went back to try to figure out how we as a system of care could do a better job. Not just one service provider, not just one evidence-based model, but how we as a system could perhaps serve children in that way better. So think about the children you're here for. Um, why is trauma such a big deal? Um, all of a sudden, it ended up on like Newsweek and Time. I find this interesting. That client that I talked about I served 10 years ago, I, got, I finished my dissertation in 2010, um, and I had trouble. Um, I love VCU. I'm a diehard RAM. Um, so I know we and spiders have difficulties at time, but that's okay. Um, so, but, um, in basketball. But what I'm saying is, is that um, when I tried to put together my committee, um, I actually had people were asking me, what does trauma have to do with social work? And I was like, what does it not have to do with social work? Um, you know, and that was 10 years ago. It's different now. Now I go back all the time to VCU and do speaking, and we blend it into our programs. But I had difficulty finding people to be on my committee because they weren't quite sure what the brain and trauma had to do with the clients we were serving. They understood the system part, but not the brain part. Um, now it's very different because now there are fMRIs and PET scans, and we know very, very clearly that, the, that trauma impacts the brain. Um, we know that trauma impacts physical health, the ability to learn, um, and the ability to regulate one's emotions. So that's, that's why that brain research is why trauma all of a sudden took a huge push. So it's called a lot of different things. It's called trauma. It's called toxic stress. It's called adverse childhood experiences. Um, but it's all kind of the same category, okay? And when I want to define what I consider to be trauma, because some people think of trauma as different things, um, what I'm going to talk about is adverse childhood experiences. So CDC did a study. They've now done it with over 400,000 people across the United States. Originally in this study, they were looking at folks with medium socioeconomic status, majority culture, access to very good health care and resources, often not the clients we work with. But that's what the study was for, and it was to look at how to reduce obesity. And they, folks on this study, they reduced obesity, they, got, they lost weight, and then they all of a sudden started gaining weight again. And they couldn't figure out why. So they did this huge study, and they found that 10 factors were related to folks who had a really hard time getting healthy with their weight. And they began to wonder, is it connected to obesity or other things? And they found that it's been connected to over, six, over about 50 to 60 different health conditions, including COPD, liver disease, heart disease, um, connected to autoimmune disorders, migraine headaches, connected to interpersonal violence, domestic, domestic violence, all kinds of things. So they started saying this, so now the CDC, the Center of Disease Control, has named trauma as the most basic public health issue in the United States today. And, and they're doing a lot of research on the lifetime consequences of violence. So to give you a sense of what those 10 factors are, this is what they are. And you actually have the A screen in the handouts that I gave you, so you're welcome to look at that. But the 10 factors are emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, all of these before the age of 18, um, neglect, feeling unwanted or unloved, uh, experiencing a divorce or separation of your caregivers before the age of 18, um, having someone in your home go to prison, having someone in your home have a mental health diagnosis or attempt suicide um, or complete suicide, um, and experiencing poverty. 
So those are all the different types um, of, of things that can happen. And so you get a score from 0 to 10. That's what that A screen is. You get a score from 0 to 10. So in the population I just described, which is considered the general population at large, um, 70, over 70% 70 of people have experienced at least one adverse child experience before the age of 18. Okay, so that's 7 out of 10, right? That's the general population. So then a lady named Dr. Nadine Harris, who's a pediatrician out in California, she was working in an urban environment, a lot of community violence, um, minority culture um, primarily, and, um, and a lot of community violence, like I said. So she decided these kids were getting referred to her IEPs and, and everybody wanted her to give them a diagnosis of ADHD and put them on Ritalin and Concerta. And she said, I just don't buy that this many kids in my community have ADHD and need to be medicated. And so she did some research and her perspective is, if I worked in a community where diabetes was one of the number one health issues, I would get very good at treating diabetes. The number one health issue in my community is violence. And so I need to get really good at treating adverse childhood experiences. So on every well, well child care check, she actually asked that ACE screen that you see. She asked the parent and she asked the child. Okay? She's a mandated reporter just like us, so people underreported, and she got the same exact results as the ACE study. Okay? Over 70%. But guess what? It was by age 7, not by age 18. And one out of six had a score over four. So she began doing co-location, behavioral health folks in her pediatric office, working with the schools, doing a lot of things I'm going to talk about today, and she saw a 50% reduction in the behavioral challenges they had. Dr. Nadine Harris, she's worth watching. She's on, she's on YouTube as well. So that's the thing, is that when we, when we look at adverse childhood experiences, what we know, and that's what this top piece is about, so we know two out of three in the general population, nine out of ten in public behavioral health. Nine out of ten which is why they're calling the ACE the new vital sign. This is something we should be asking in every setting we're in. We should be screening. We should be asking this question because it is the most basic public health need and it's not asked and it's not paid attention to. In terms of violence exposure in the United States, 46 million of 76 million children will be exposed to violence this year in some way. Additionally, there's that fact of 224 million adults out of a population of 318 million adults in this country have at least one ACE, and if you have one, it's 87% more likely that you have two. One out of six have four plus. As your ACE score goes up, so do your health risks, okay? And so do the behavior problems. And so that's where they came up with this triangle. You can go on the CDC and look up about the ACEs, and what they put is adverse child experiences at the bottom rung. And the reason for that is it disrupts neuronal development. So, um, so the way that I explain this is you've got this brain, right? And this is how Dr. Siegel explains it. And you have the downstairs part of the brain. This is the limbic system. This is your fight, flight, or freeze center. So this is where threat happens, okay? When threat happens, you have three choices, fight, flight, or freeze, okay? On top of that, you have your cerebral cortex, main nervous system, 70% of your brain. And um, I call this often the guard dog that barks, and I call this the owl, okay? And so this part of your brain is where empathy lives, problem solving, attention, and focus. All things that are very good to have if you're getting, if you go to school, or if you have to engage with authority figures. You need to problem solve, you need to be able to calm down and regulate, focus, and pay attention. What we know from research is if you flip your lid, if this part of your brain isn't what's dominating, and this part of your brain's dominating, we call it your brain getting emotionally hijacked, then you go into fight, flight, or freeze. We also know there's something called neuroplasticity. So every experience you have, what fires together, wires together. So let me explain. So when I have an experience, here's a neuron, right? There's the nucleus, and we got axons over here and dendrites over here. So right now when I'm talking to you, a bunch of neurons are firing. You're either thinking about what I'm saying, or what you're gonna eat for dinner, or that you've gotta go pick up your kids or meet somebody. Whatever you're thinking about, this whole set of neurons is firing, okay? And when we have repeated experiences, we develop what's called a millennium sheath, which basically means a highway, okay? So some behaviors, we have Highway 64. We go there really fast without even thinking. Some behaviors, we have a very old country road, and it's hard for us to get there, okay? The kids that we work with, because of this level of violence, their, their brains, their Interstate 64 is fight, 
flight or freeze. They fight authority, they run from authority, they stay very still until authority disappears. And guess what? Their experiences in life taught them to do that. They're doing what they know. And it's in their brain. It's not because they just want to be difficult or they don't like us. It's because that is what their brain has been taught to do. What we know from the research is there are three things that people with trauma need to learn how to do to be successful in life. Number one is self-regulation. They need to be able to bring this top part of their brain back down and calm down, focus, pay attention, self-regulation. Number two is they need to have a positive self-identity. That basically means that many kids we work with and adults, they think what happened to them is who they are. So we have to ask the question, what's strong, not what's wrong? Because most kids I've worked with in juvenile attention, they can give me their rap sheet in two seconds. But you ask them anything they do well, and they have no idea how to answer that question. Unless it involves, I had one kid, and he says, yeah, well, I hijack cars really well. And I can start, no, I'm asking for something positive. You do really well. And he has a really hard time saying that, because nobody ever asked. OK, so that's number two. One is self-regulation. Two is positive self-identity. And the last skill they need is co-regulation, the ability to be in a healthy relationship, say their feelings, ask for what they need. The sad part about the brain is there's this part called Broca's area. Broca's area is the part of the brain that lets us take a feeling and express it, a very important skill. If you've had trauma, Broca's area actually shuts down, and you actually have difficulty identifying feelings. That, if you can't tell your feelings and tell someone what you need, it becomes extremely difficult to get your needs met. So when I think about this, what I think about, Malcolm Gladwell wrote an awesome book called Outliers. I really like that book. We look at an outlier. An outlier is something outside the norm. So you look at a story like Blindside, which was based on a real story. You look at a kid that lived in a Memphis project, had very difficult life challenges, ends up on the NFL in a, in a family that really loves him. And we say, well, that doesn't happen very often, right? And what Malcolm Gladwell says is, okay, well, let's look at Kenya. Usually somebody from Kenya ends up on getting either a gold, a silver, or a bronze in the track in the Olympics. Is there something in Kenya water that's different than United States water that they usually place in track? Probably not. So the, the link here is, is what he says is it could be because in Kenya, you run five to six miles a day just because. And here in the United States, I wanted to get my car as close to the school of law as possible so I didn't have to walk, right? Or if Walmart and Lowe's are next to each other, I'm going to change parking lots. So why is this important? Because his principle, Malcolm Gladwell says, if you do 10,000 hours of anything, you're going to get good at it. Pretty simple principle. So our kids and our families have 10,000 hours of fight, flight, or freeze. And guess what? That muscle's really strong. It's their Interstate 64. They get there really fast. What we have to do as a community is give them 10,000 hours of self-regulation, positive self-identity, and co-regulation. And if we don't, their brain's not able to do that. Does it make sense? OK, questions about that? Because I kind of, sometimes I get really excited and I talk too fast. And I do come up for air sometimes. This is one of those moments. OK, we're going to keep going. So disruption neurodevelopment development, that's what that means. And so then what happens is to then cope, to cope with that level of stress, they pick, they often end up with social, emotional, and cognitive impairments. And they adopt at-risk coping behaviors. So give me a behavior problem that any kid you know or have worked with, it can be any behavior. Um, is a problem, gets them in trouble. Any behavior? Setting fires. OK, so setting fires. So then if, if you draw on your paper like a circle and write setting fires in the middle, here's the thing. Every behavior meets a need, OK? So for example, I like to use to speed as in driving too fast on the road. Not a healthy behavior. So what I got out of speeding was I got to hit the snooze bar a lot more and procrastinate, right? I got a little bit of an adrenaline rush because I'm a little bit of an adrenaline junkie. And I also thought, well, what I do is so important. Other people, I'm kind of like an ambulance, and other people just need to move out of the way anyway. So not healthy, all right? But that behavior met that need, OK? So setting fires. What does a kid get out of setting a fire? Attention, OK? What else does a kid get out of setting a fire? Control. So attention, control, what else? It's kind of cool. So they get the cool factor. I haven't had that answer before. I like that. OK, the cool factor. All right, so attention control, the cool factor, probably some power. And it's a little bit of a release. High school, ex-boyfriend, I loved burning his stuff. It's a little bit of a release. OK, might be unhealthy, but a little bit of a release. OK, so anybody here, have you ever wanted to be cool? You ever done anything, cool factor? OK, you ever wanted power? Or would you like to give up power for the rest of your life? 
Anybody here vote for giving up control over anything in the rest of your life? Anybody here ever feel stress? Anybody here ever want to release stress? Okay, anybody here would never want attention again? Okay, so the point is that that child's needs that sets fire are the same needs we have. So what's the problem? The problem is the strategy. What's in the center? Because what we do is we put the problem in the center and we draw spokes out of the wheel. If I had a, a whiteboard, I'd draw that. So we put attention, control, release, cool factor, all these things. So what we have to do is replace the coping behavior. We have to take out setting fire and replace it with something that will give them control, power, attention, the cool factor, and a release of stress. What is something someone does to release stress here? That's positive. Okay, <laughs> sports, great, sports. What is one of the first things we take away when a kid acts up at school? Sports, right, or recess, right? We have a kid that can't sit still, can't follow rules, has a difficulty, and we're gonna stop the 30 minutes they have in a day to move, okay? Here's the thing, interesting thing about sports. What does sports teach if you're involved in positive sports? It teaches focus, control, teamwork, self-regulation, positive self-identity, co-regulation. So the very thing we take away is the very thing they need 10,000 hours of practice in, and it gets taken away. So here's an example. Had a, ch had a kid, he was on parole. His parole officer was saying very directly to me, I'm just waiting to pop him. I'm waiting to violate him. I don't like him, and I'm ready. The school didn't like him very much either, and he was in an alternative ed program. And it was on a point system. We know point systems work very badly with kids who have trauma but we still use them. And so this kid, and it's kind of like a kid who is involved all day in school, and a point system is kind of like this. So what if I really screwed up this presentation today, and VCU came back and said, so I'll take back your PhD and you can start again tomorrow. How motivated would I be? I'd be like, bump that, <laughs> I'm gonna do something else. That's kind of like what a level system or a point system is to some kids. They blow it, and they've lost everything, and they have to start all over. In a brain that has a very star strong top of their brain, a point system will work, but not when you're down here. So here's this kid, he's in alternative school, and he's getting popped every other minute, right? He's out of compliance, he's in trouble, and they keep adding on more and more days to the alternative school, and he's just stopped caring, and quite frankly, the staff would like him to leave, okay? So how do we help motivate this kid? Because the number one thing is when you want to change, you have to be motivated. You have to want something, okay? So we asked him, I asked him, what would you really like? And he said, I want to play football. I really want to play football. I said, okay, let's see if we can play football. So one of the goals was to get this kid back to his home school. So I went to his coach at his home school and his principal and said, will you let him play football? He doesn't have to play games, but can he practice every day? Just practice. They're like, okay, he can practice. And I said, whatever happens, whatever bad choices he makes, don't take away football practice. He doesn't have to play any games, but don't take away. They're like, okay. The alternative said, okay. So here's what happened. All of a sudden, amazingly, the kid didn't violate his curfew anymore. Guess what? He was dog tired and asleep by nine. So he wasn't in trouble with his parole officer for violating curfew anymore. He stopped arguing with his mom, because guess what? He was dog tired, and he didn't have the energy to, to talk to mom, okay? Additionally, all of that stress, he wanted to do well in school because he couldn't wait till two o'clock to get on the field, right? And guess what? He was making relationships at his home school, he was working with a team, and has anybody ever here had to ride the bench for a while? Do you want to stay on the bench? No, you want to get in the game. So he started asking himself the question, how do I get in the game? And his whole team wrapped around him and helped him get in the game, and guess what? He stopped violating parole, he got out of the alternative school, and he did well at his own school. That's restorative justice, trauma-informed. That's what this is about. It's about figuring out how do we help this disrupted neuronal development brain, how do we help them adopt healthy behaviors and not adopt health risk behaviors. Because if they continue to adopt health risk behaviors, then they end up dead or in institutions or jail. That's where kids and adults go that can't figure out how to adopt health behaviors. Make sense? Questions? Okay. All right, so this is just kind of confirmation. We call it consequences of lifetime exposure to violence. Basically, it affects every part of the body and there are tons of studies. There's ever been a doubt that behavioral health was not connected to physical health, that doubt is gone. We know that it's very connected, okay? We also know that it's a huge cost. CDC did a study, they looked at one year of confirmed child abuse cases in the United States, okay? Not suspected, not reported, confirmed child abuse cases. They tracked those kids across their lifetime for one year and it was $124 billion. That's what it cost to take care of them. 
per kid, it costs about $33,000 for their health care costs as a child, $11,000 adult medical costs, $144,000 in their work productivity losses as an adult, about $8,000 in child welfare costs, $7,000 in criminal justice costs, $8,000 in special ed costs per child. So, it'd be really nice to take that money and reinvest it in prevention and actually helping these kids get healthier because it's a huge, huge cost to our system. And so we're currently working with payers who are helping us think about how could we spend our health care dollars different to wrap around this population that's experiencing the consequences of violence. Okay. All right, so what I want to do is I want to play, this is just a seven-minute video. It comes from the um, Office of Victim, um, Victimization and Crime. And I just wanted to ask, are there any questions? Because that's kind of like the big picture that I just gave. Um, this video will actually give you a little detail about different uh, stories of people who've been through um, violence and different experiences and how it affects them and how different systems are trying to solve it. Okay. Yeah. My mother and my brother were murdered in front of me. He put the gun to my head and he had me beg for my life. I was 10. I just turned 10. It's hard to come out and say that I was a victim and that I was abused, when, especially when you're little, because it's like a big secret that's always on your back and that you never know when it's gonna come out. The image of my brother falling on that concrete floor and people stepping and just kicking with shoes on his face. I couldn't get that image out of my um, head. Trauma is an overwhelming event. It takes away our safety, it creates a sense of helplessness, and it continues to affect our perception of our reality. Some of the telltale signs of trauma are quite evident. Many of these symptoms, it's not that we don't see them, it's that we don't put together the entire sort of picture of what trauma is. Inability to sleep or interrupted sleep, uh, inability to focus on what's going on, really not able to attend to learning. Adults need to be aware of children who are exposed to violence and intervene early and stop it. I don't like the environment that I stay in. People getting killed every day, drug deals, people getting snatched, raped, cut up. Whether it is a child who witnesses violence or a child who is the victim, you can't be fearful and be able to live your normal life. You have to be able to think clearly, and when you're traumatized, you can't do that. Violence continues then to affect the child in their perception of their community, of their family. The danger is right around the corner. And the brain gets wired to expect danger. My dad started like actually physically beating me to the point to where I'd go to school with covered in bruises. I don't know how many times I've been threatened to be killed by my own dad. My brother got shot in the head. He ain't make it. It makes you afraid at times. It makes you feel that, oh my God, you know what? I just lost a friend. I just lost a family member. It just makes you feel that, hey, I could die next. I could be the next one dead. What trauma does is it triggers what's called the amygdala in the brain, which is our fight, flight, free center. And it truly is a change in the brain and a change in the stress hormones that are flowing through the body. All our brains have what we call alarm systems because the brain now has been wired for danger and it's triggered into this fight flight, we don't just get over a traumatic event. It continues to impact us. I started hearing my mom scream in the middle of the night and it got to the point where he started like beating me and my sisters. I let my anger build up, didn't talk to anybody about it. When you hold everything aside, it's like a bomb and you get, it's like, you ready to explode and just somebody push that last button. Most kids who've experienced violence oftentimes have experienced multiple types of violence. In the kids we see, um, the average number of different types of violent trauma is four. 
And so complex trauma then affects multiple areas of the brain because it's ongoing. Maybe it's gang warfare, maybe it's drug use and abuse in the family, maybe it's domestic violence, maybe it's bullying at school. And if there is a layering effect of cumulative violence, it changes literally the DNA. It all started off with the hugging game. He would take us into his room. We would sit on his lap and, and he would hug us and we weren't supposed to tell anyone. When I was five, I would have to leave kindergarten or class and go home and have uh, sex with this man who was in his 50s. I remember the long walk home and crying and falling down and having to get back up and walking on. Child sexual abuse exists in the neighborhood, it exists unfortunately at our schools, at our churches, at our homes, everywhere. And there are children out there suffering. Our first assault was in high school. I met a guy at the church and he wanted to be my friend. I thought it'd be great. And instead he assaulted me and I felt very scared. When you have a child that doesn't get to work through that abuse in an appropriate manner, that abuse doesn't go away. I mean, it lives in that child. Exposure to violence in childhood has been found to be associated with a really unbelievable range of long-term impacts. Very young children who are exposed to violence many times have difficulty in establishing a trusting relationship these children have fears. You're twice as likely to develop depression. You're probably three times as likely to develop some type of anxiety disorder. As they move into school age, they may have very, very serious behavior problems. As we look at adolescence, we see children running away. Sometimes children may be involved in the juvenile justice system, which puts the child at risk for being an adult offender. And so the cost of violence is staggering. I felt isolated. Nobody knew what I was going through. To go three years without talking about it, I imploded. Finally, after like stressing and stressing and keeping everything bottled up and everything building up, I just finally broke down one day and attempted suicide. Suicide is the third leading cause of death of children and adolescents in this country. We always ask in every case, what role might child abuse have played? My mother, she knew that stuff was going on, but it just seemed like she didn't really care. She never stopped that abuse. And to this day, I've never forgotten what what some of my family members have done to me. These are traumatized kids. And so how do we then, as adults, professionals, caregivers, put a system around children that really is trauma-informed? Happy feeling, good job, okay? So I want what do we do differently to help rewire their brain? And then ultimately, how do we build capacity in order to really help our kids? Everybody come together, whether it's in the community, in the home, in the school, wherever children are, and child by child, think of ways in which we can intervene early and educate people about what children need in order to grow, to thrive, and to continue to be resilient human beings. So I think that's what I want to spend, you know, the next kind of watching this clock up here and until I'm going to try to finish around 425, 430 is talking about really a trauma-informed system of care. But that's really what this is about. And as I speak, I've had the honor since last April of, of training about 3,500 stakeholders in the state of Virginia. Um, it's exciting to listen to people talk. And, and I'm actually uh, being a part of the trauma-informed community network, um, something that we didn't receive a grant for, but three or four people got together to say, hey, what do we want to do about trauma? Because if not now, when? When are, we gonna, when are we really gonna start talking to each other and do something? Now we have over 30 members just who are donating their time from their agencies to come to a solution about the service gaps that exist in the greater Richmond area, including Chesterfield and Henrico, and how we can improve 
um, our system of care. And that's really what, what this is about. And there's the piece of good news, which you have behind the ACE screen is a resilience questionnaire. Because here's the thing, there's one card that trumps ACEs every time, and that's the resilience card. And resilience can be taught. We can build self-regulation skills, we can build positive self-identity, and we can build co-regulation skills. So again, we have to ask not just what's, ro what's wrong, but ask what's strong. And that's really what um, systemic trauma and understanding um, how the experience of the child and the family is in the system. What you also have in your packet is something called the emotional chain of custody. This comes from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. If you've never been to that site, it's very worth going to, NCTSN, National Child Traumatic Stress Network. In, in 2000, Congress thought that child traumatic stress was of such importance that they created a separate division of the Substance Abuse Mental Health Administration called the NCTSN to do nothing but study the effects of toxic stress in children. They have toolkits. Um, Adrian was nice enough to print this one. This is an educator's tool kit that comes from their work. they are ones for juvenile justice, child welfare, detention facilities, mental health workers. They've put a lot of time into figuring out how to improve each and every system. Um, in this area, Henrico and Chesterfield partnered with the Trauma-Informed Community Network and engaged in the NCTSN's Child Welfare Toolkit model in assessing how they're doing in serving their kids and families. And from that work, they've now been the first two counties by the DBHDS to be granted a more intensive training on the entire Child Welfare Toolkit. Um, and that's one of our purposes, is how do we help improve the systems of care in which we work? So if you look at the emotional chain of custody and you imagine, you know, you've got a family and let's say you've got a kid and he's five and he's been through domestic violence and watching mom and dad um, beat each other and upset and all of a sudden a really bad fight breaks out, big police officers burst in, they drag him out, put him into custody, mom goes to the hospital, dad goes to jail, kid doesn't get to say goodbye. Really bad scene. That's bad. So that's what happens to the family system, that circle all the way on the left. But then here's the thing. Then that kid gets shot into our system of care. And if you look at that picture, it's really pretty freaking overwhelming. I mean, there are so many different pieces and parts of our system. They've got to figure out how to navigate victim witness and guardian ad litems and defense attorneys and judges and school systems and child protective service systems and mental health agencies. And I've worked with kids who we finally had a treatment team. They've got 20 people in that room, and they have no idea what everybody's doing for them. And the people in there don't always know what they're supposed to be doing for them. So I think what's really important to say is these, these families have to move through that entire complicated system of care to get to recovery. And it's not an easy thing to navigate. And there are definite practices that each system uses that actually re-traumatizes kids. One of the most, one of the most uh, popular is that some families have to have an assessment like eight times, and they're answering the same questions eight times. Who wants to talk about being raped eight times to eight different people who can't read the same report and figure that out? I sat on a, on a, a multidisciplinary team um, a while back. This child, her mother had been murdered. The team was there to help her figure out how to stabilize and have better services with her aunt. One of the people on the team asked, where is your mother today? They didn't read the report. And she just froze. And then one of us that had said, hey, She's here with her aunt. That's her guardian. That's where we're going to focus. Again, other children I've seen, I've sat on multidisciplinary teams. Another child that I, that I was looking at, at a case, this was a child who um, a guardian ad litem called me and said, hey, the judge went to one of your trainings and said that I might have a trauma case in front of me. Can I staff it with you? No identifying information. I said, sure. And the GAL, so there was this kid, and he was sexually abused at five. And I'm thinking, and we're wondering if it's a trauma issue. Okay, but he kept going. He said, so he was removed from the home, uh, bounced around a lot of foster care. We're going through reunification now at 12. We're doing reunification at Burger King. Every time he comes to meet his mom at Burger King, he starts throwing stuff at her, and we can't figure out why he's being so defiant. He's been in in-home services for a while. We're wondering what to do. And I'm thinking, well, the first thing is to acknowledge and validate that this kid has been through a trauma and hopefully wrap a, a, a group of folks together because this kid was starting to get in trouble at school because of all the stress with this. 
And the question, and this is where it gets tough, because what I'm going to talk about is raising the standards of how we do care and everybody getting trauma-informed. I said, does he have a trauma-informed behavioral health provider? I'm not trying to get him to come to my agency, but does he have somebody that knows scope of practice? And they said, no, but they were hoping you could come train him for two hours on a weekend and they'll make that happen. And it just makes me want to scream. No, that's not good enough. That's not good enough for the kids we work with. Um, that's not okay. And I see that happen over and over again. And so all of us have to kind of ask ourselves, what is trauma-informed care, and how are we in our agency, in our organization, in our community, creating trauma-informed organizations and trauma-informed communities? And the question I often get is people will come and say, oh, like I go to school systems and train, and they're like, oh, you need to train the teachers, oh, you need to train the principals, oh, you need to train the superintendent. And I'm happy to train all those people, but here's the thing. There is no one person in Virginia who is Oz and is going to change this system. There is no Oz. I've been looking for them. They don't exist. Okay? You are Oz. At 4.30 today, at 4.40 today, what will you do differently as a result of understanding trauma-informed care? That's what I ask folks, because you're Oz. Every single one of us can do something different when we walk out of this room. 10% is learning about it. 90% is doing something about it. And I think that's what I want to challenge folks. What are we going to do about it when we understand it? Trauma-informed care is really, when we look at it, it is about in, in increasing the knowledge, trauma-informed knowledge, attitudes, and creating trauma-informed behaviors with the children, adults, caregivers, and providers of service in the system, all three. And the caregivers often get ignored, and the providers of service often get ignored, quite frankly. They don't take care of themselves and they burn out. In general, just in the, in the behavioral health profession, we have people burning out in less than five years, which means they spend more time in getting their college education of how to practice in the field than staying in the field. And then the kids go through another loss. In this country, 25 million people are estimated to need substance abuse services. We currently serve 2.5, because that's all the system can handle serving. We have a shortage of human service professionals, and we have to figure out how to protect the ones that we do have. So a lot of this is about care coordination. It is about figuring out how to bring all the parties together and have a conversation. Here's a good example. I got a call from a school one day, and the school said, wow, we really need you to come and train our school. And I'm like, that's great. How'd you hear about me? And they're like, this garden in Lightham came into the IEP, and he told us our IEP is not trauma-informed, and we better get on the ball, and we don't want the GAL to know more than us, so could you please come and catch us up on what's going on? And I was like, what an awesome GAL. So to question and say, hey, are we really providing the best service for this child? And the school wrapped around it. They wanted to learn. They wanted to figure out something different. But they needed someone to say something like, hey, there's a different way. So we got to coordinate services better. We also have to really provide support and guidance to children and family. The thing is, is that children experience their world in the context of family. And when they lose, when we look at foster care, foster care outcomes are horrible. Kids are more likely to end up in jail than in college if they go to foster care. The results are pretty bad. They're pretty bad. And so foster care is necessary, but it's not the first stop. We know that investing in biological families and reunification is a much better solution than foster care. And that we only want to go that route if there's no other option. And they've done research to compare in cases where it was really on the border of do we terminate parental rights or do we provide more RAP services to the biological family, the folks that erred on doing RAPs in the biological family, those kids' outcomes are better. And yet I work with a lot of judges who really feel that like terminating parental rights quickly is what's better. And when they get some education and understand, they start to think about different ways. Because nobody wants to see a child get hurt. I don't. I don't want a kid to go back in a family. It's not just go back to the family. We have to provide the wrap of services around the biological family. Because many of the caregivers are kids that got missed in the system. And they came back into the system as parents. So we've got to provide a lot of sources to resource families and biological families. And what we know is that we have to change the culture of agencies. We have to create safe physical and emotional environments. And emotional safety is just as important as physical safety. We have to think, do people feel emotionally safe? Another example. So there was um, a child, this child, um, there was alleged sexual abuse. CPS had been called. Of course, it's a mandate that a detective interview too. Um, SCAN, Stop Child Abuse Now has a forensic interview center that's trauma-informed, that makes a child feel safe to have that interview occur. But it's far from this particular county. It was a good 30 to 35 minutes. The detective and CPS worker, who were very, very good people, didn't have time to get there, so they called the parent and told the parent, you're going to have to meet us at the courthouse to do this investigation. 
So up drives the mom, up drives the 12-year-old. The 12-year-old walks through the metal detector, gets patted down by the bailiffs. Courtrooms are designed to be scary. She's shaken, mom's shaken. This happens to be the courtroom where she watched her father be arrested and where her parents got divorced. So there are not a lot of good memories there. She gets escorted upstairs, separated from her mother, put in a room in front of a camera, and asked what happened. She walked out of the interview room and she told her mom and me, I wasn't about to tell them a damn thing. It wasn't safe. There are things that we can do to make kids feel safe so that they can tell us the information that we need to actually help protect them and to engage them in different ways. But we get busy. We get very high caseloads. We get really busy. So I like to say that trauma-informed care is not something we do on top of everything else we do. It is the way in which we do everything. There was a different way to do that forensic interview, and it could have been trauma-informed, but it wasn't. And probably that detective and CPS worker who really wanted to protect this child didn't realize how much that one decision affected that interview. So um, safety, we have to be trustworthy. We have to be true to our word. We also have to offer voice and choice along the way. There's always a choice. It may be the choice to walk to your room or be carried. It may be a choice to walk in the courtroom or be escorted by a bailiff, but it's always a choice. And we have to constantly, because see, trauma takes people's power away. We have to constantly give choice and voice to, our, to clients who've experienced trauma. So we have to ask ourselves, again, how trauma-informed are our services and our role? First, we ask ourselves, right? Man, stuff. National Council of Behavioral Health Care is pushing very hard to um, create trauma-informed organizations. They've trained over 200 organizations in the country. Um, a lot of states. Um, we actually are excited at, at Family Preservation Services. We're the first uh, private um, mental health agency that's statewide that's becoming a trauma-informed organization and engaging. Because we really think we've got to improve ourselves. We have to apply this to ourselves. So I open this up because I think this is a model that you can apply to your services and then offer to other organizations. The first is to think about how do you do screening and assessment? Are you screening for ACEs? Are you screening for trauma? How do you ask those questions? How do you introduce that information to clients? Is it appropriate for you to do it, or do you need to refer them to somebody? If you're screening, when do you refer them for a behavioral health assessment? How do you do screening and assessment in whatever rule that you're in? How do you do consumer-driven services? How do you go back and ask clients how they do services? So one of the things that we got Henrico and Chesterfield DSS to do is they led focus groups with families, with kids, um, with service providers to say, how are we doing? What is it like to move through our social service program? What is the service like? And they got really great information on how to change their services. And we all need to do that. We also need to educate the workforce. So events like this that I get invited to, the first place is it starts with knowledge. People need to know what can they do differently. We need to think about evidence-based models and emerging practices, particularly in be behavioral health. Are agencies actually in scope of practice? Is the behavioral health person you refer to, do they actually know how to work with trauma? And I feel really strongly about that one. Um, create a safe and secure environment, environment. There are ways to do environmental scans of an agency. Is it safe? What's the first thing that clients think of when they come in? Are they going to talk to you? This is really important because they say best practice is being trauma-informed, gender-informed, and culturally informed. How do we make it safe? They call it cultural humility. One of the things with gender-informed that's very interesting is it's not, it's one of the things that's being looked at as males, right? So if we think about what, what, is, what are men in general taught? What is being a man? What does society in general teach? What does it mean you have to do? Be tough, don't be weak, don't cry. What else? Provide. Okay. All right, don't show emotion. Be tough, be strong, provide. So then we introduce them to therapy. And they walk in my office. And I say, be vulnerable, cry, show emotion, let go, trust me. Right? And then when they don't, I say, I'm going to write a report to your parole officer because you're noncompliant to fight in opposition with the therapeutic services I'm trying to provide when all they're doing is doing exactly what they've been taught to do as a man. We have to acknowledge coming in that this is going to feel real awkward. And in some cultures, it feels even more awkward. Because in some communities I work in, I might as well be DA or CPS to be a mental health clinician. They are not going to talk to me. Because I'm somebody that snatches kids and narcs. 
They don't trust me. So we have to be trustworthy and build that trust and create a safe environment, create a relationship with communities so we actually feel safe because many of our systems have traumatized kids. Absolutely, every system has traumatized kids. And then we have to do a whole lot of partnership building, which is why I'm here today. I believe strongly in that. How do we, all of those people on the emotional chain of custody, how do we work so that all those systems work together? So some specific stuff. This comes from the NCTSN. What can judges do or attorneys do that's really trauma-informed? One, know the trauma-informed services offered in your area. So one of the things the Greater Richmond TICN is doing is trying to say who is doing what in Henrico, Chesterfield, and Richmond. Who do I refer to? Who does trauma-informed preschool programs? Who does trauma-informed behavioral health programs? Who has a trauma-informed forensic center? Who does trauma-informed educational rights? I mean, all those different things. Who do I go to? And I would encourage you that if you have questions about this community, reach out to the TICN. Lisa Wright at SCAN is kind of our hub person, but we all love talking about trauma. Finding out who is doing good trauma-informed services in your area. And for judges, empower families to tell the court what services they need. I did, it was kind of funny, I had one judge who was so lovely, and he says, you know, I don't get it, Allison, I'm on the bench, and I'm looking down, and I'm saying to a kid, tell me what you really need, and he looks scared. I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> so <laughs> he's in trouble, <laughs> and he's in court, and you can take away his freedom, and I'm an expert witness, and I want to pee in my pants half the time. So, yes, that's probably not the moment to ask him how he's really feeling about what he needs. And the judge was like, oh, I thought he'd feel safe. I'm like, no, probably not when there's a door that goes straight to jail right behind you. Um, so, <laughs> we have to, <laughs> we, but it was, a, it was a good judge, I mean, he wouldn't, so it's like, no, what you do is actually have people outside your, your courtroom screening and asking questions and preparing reports, so you're aware of these experiences. One court, a judge in Culpeper, now orders ACE screens on every parent, every adult that comes through his court, period. Period. Yep, just Somerville, right? Every single kid. He's like, I don't know what we're going to do with them, but we're going to get it on everybody. <laughs> right? And I was like, go Judge Somerville. So, but, and, and now more and more we're working on what do we do with that screening? There's a school in Chesterfield, a Title I school, an elementary school, and the principal was like, let's screen every single fourth grader. We'll figure out how to find them services. Every single kid. Let's find out what the trauma is. So when you educate people, people become willing to kind of talk about how do we screen, how do we talk about this, how do we figure out services. So empower families, make it safe enough so families can usually ask for what they need. And sometimes they don't know what they need, and you have to educate them what services are available. Absolutely have services connected to the parent. We don't do enough services with caregivers. We focus on the kid. Usually a kid is what we call a symptom bearer. The kid's jumping up and down with their behavior to go, and my family needs help. So I call them the brave one, right? But if you just treat a kid, that's, that, it doesn't work. And I feel strongly enough about it that if there are people out there that just work with kids and not with a family, they shouldn't be working with kids. You should work with families and find out solutions. And I work a lot with the Community Service Act, with FAP teams, of how do we put in more services for caregivers. Ask those questions as a judge. Um, there are bench cards. The NTS, NCTSN has bench cards you can print out for judges and um, for attorneys. And it's interesting because there was one judge, we do VRP services, and this particular judge, if not everybody showed up and he didn't know how to handle a case, he would just put the kid in detention until there was time to figure it out, right? And, and so I was like, yeah, let's not do that. Detention's pretty disruptive. Um, so what would it be like if you asked everybody related to that case to come to court? And he's like, well, I don't have that kind of power. And I was like, okay, confused. Um, so, <laughs> but he, he didn't think that he could bring everybody in. So we started working in the community of getting people in. It was funny because one of my workers said he's got that bench card sitting on the, on the thing up there. What's that thing called they sit on? Pul pulpits? No. Pulpit benches. Thank you. That's it. That's the word I'm looking for. <laughs> the thing they sit up there on, right? It's on the bench. They've got it sitting there, their bench card, right? And they've got it sitting there, and he actually stopped court. He went to another case on the docket, and he said, everybody's showing up for this kid. They worked on a plan. The kid didn't go to detention. The kid actually went home with services. And now people know they better show up when this court has, has the docket because everybody's going to be asked, show up, let's figure out a plan. Let's not just put kids in detention. Um, so, uh, again, um, just remember the consequences when birth parents don't get involved. So just understanding, first of all, there's an extremely high correlation between substance abuse and trauma. It is very, very commemorative. For women, 99% almost of women who've experienced trauma use substances. 
So if you've got a substance case, you have somebody you're working with that uses substances, I would be asking trauma questions. And why is that? What is the most popular way in the United States to self-regulate? Alcohol. Why? Because it works. <laughs> you know, people wouldn't be using it if it didn't calm them down, okay? Pot works until it causes a whole bunch of other problems. Okay? But that's that triangle again. It's a coping behavior that solves the self-regulation needs immediately, but has major consequences on the other side. I had some kids that I worked with in detention. It was the first time they'd been clean in a really long time when we were successful in keeping drugs out of the detention facility. And they were clean. And their brain had learned everything high, so they couldn't remember everything sober. So we had to reteach them everything but then they were like, oh my gosh, I can run and play basketball and think. Who knew I could think without pot? Yes, you can think without pot. So it was, it was literally having to figure out how to do these systems. So remember substance abuse, a lot of substance abuse, and we have to help them figure out, again, Interstate 64 to substance abuse, we've got to help them the country road think of other ways to self-regulate. Um, unresolved childhood trauma, remember many of the, ki the parents, if you've got a kid with a high A score, probably the parent has a high A score and we need to figure out how to treat that. Often, parents, when I used to do, I'm a CSOTP, which means I'm a Certified Sex Offender Treatment Provider in Virginia. We had this brilliant idea um, with, to, when we ran our program, so we would have the parents sit in the waiting room, and we would do all these services with the kid, and we, we do a lot of self-regulation teaching and how to calm down, because again, we know that if you do really good um, sexually abusive training with kids, you can increase them from like 70% of not reoffending to almost 90% of not reoffending. So we would do all this really great work with the kids, and then they'd come out relaxed and like we had them regulated, and their parents were like, rawr, 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 rawr. you know, I'm just talking about regular work, and da -da -da. you heard what this woman said, da -da -da. and we were like, oh, that's bad. We probably shouldn't have left them out there on their own, right? We should have been seeing them. So we started parenting groups. So they were learning the same thing as the kids were learning. And what was remarkable to me is invariably 70% of the mothers of kids we served were sexual abuse victims. So imagine being a survivor and now your son is a perpetrator. Major trauma is going to come up that we weren't even talking about because we didn't think about including the family. So just remember that a lot of times parents may not pick up on red flags because of their own trauma. They're blocking, they're disassociating. And we have to do work with them to help them pick up on red flags um, and protect their children. If we choose, to work with parents. Um, well, one, if their parents have chronic trauma, a lot of times they have difficulty having positive interactions with their kids. They have difficulty protecting their children. They have difficulty being engaged in their child's therapy and helping them recover. And they also get really stressed out by all the authority figures that are bumping into them once they enter a system. They get really overwhelmed and they don't do well. And they act out and do things where we're going, please don't do that, and then bam, they do it. And you're like, okay. So you run back. So it's really important to realize that a lot of the parents' behavior is that same circle. It's, it's that fight, flight, or freeze stuff. It's that downstairs brain stuff. And if we don't, oh, I'm missing a slide, but that's okay. If we don't work with them, the, the results are really bad. Kids don't, don't finish therapy if their parents aren't engaged. Um, they don't often do well. They become defiant. So kids do badly if their caregivers aren't getting treatment. In fact, the most that I've seen has been able to maintain a kid if I'm not dealing with a parent. Um, so other things, just I talked about the foster care system. Um, for juvenile justice, um, this was one that I liked from the Casey Foundation. We need to redefine the terms that can lead a young person into a correctional facility and protect the public by detaining the most violent felons, not the young people who, with the proper supports, could be promising members of the next generation. So who are we detaining? Why are we detaining them? This applies to schools, too, because I'm sure you know we have a major problem in the country with um, over expulsion and over suspension of, of African American males, Hispanic males, and special education students. And it's bad in Virginia. Um, the Department of Education and Department of Criminal Justice Services is starting to partner to figure out how do we turn that tide. Because if you look at the stats, these kids are ending up arguing, being defiant, and they get, they get kicked out of school. And so one of the interesting things is we're really pushing, and, I, and there's some new grants out that schools are looking at, the due date's May 2nd, of actually they're trying to get, DCGS and DOE are trying to get schools to do restorative justice. Only county that really does it is Fairfax right now. Chesterfield is starting to play with it. 
Um, but basically, restorative justice looks like this. So this is a real story. So you got a fourth grade um, boy, and he kicks a fourth grade girl in the ankle and shatters her ankle. He's immediately expelled. Okay? But what happens in Fairfax is before an expulsion happens, they have to go to the restorative justice circle, and they have to talk about other, other types of consequences that could happen instead of expulsion. So when they do this research about what actually happened, what they found out was the girl punched him in the nose first. They were friends. He didn't mean to break her ankle. Okay, they didn't make it okay, but it makes it a little different. So what they did is they actually bring the parents together and the kids together, and they come up with what will be the consequence. Because remember, we want the fight, flight, or freeze to go down. We want this part of the brain to come back, and we want to teach empathy. We want to teach problem solving and attention and focus. And that comes from natural consequences, not punishment. Okay? Um, so when they sat down, they had the girl talk about all the things she wasn't going to be able to do because she had a boot on her ankle for eight weeks. All the losses she had, the things she couldn't complete, we had the parent, they had the parent talk about it. And one of the things the parent says is she's not going to be able to do any of her chores or help me at all in the house for eight weeks. And the other parent said, you know what? My son will be there at 8 a.m. every Saturday morning for eight weeks. He's going to take care of that for you. So that actually happened. They coordinated it. And the, and the other parent said, I don't want that kid expelled. Okay? That's not what I want. So this child got to stay in school, stay on grade point average, be engaged in the school system, and what he had to do when he was doing all of her chores is watch all the things she couldn't do. He had to watch the pain and suffering he had caused to a friend. At the end of the eight weeks, they pulled them back together and talked about, okay, what have we learned from this, right? And, um, and, and one of the things the girl said, they said, how do you feel? I mean, do you feel like there's restitution been made? And the girl said, actually, my ankle still hurts. Could he come back for another eight weeks? <laughs> Which is kind of funny. But, um, and he's like, no. But, so, <laughs> but they worked it out, and they got to keep in school. So again, there's, there's some solutions of how, with violence, whether it has to deal with detention or school, we don't have to go, it is very, most restrictive is being kicked out of school. Most restrictive is not having, you know, being in detention. When I ran post-D, I had kids who were in and out of detention all the time. I built that program for the Merrimack Center. And these kids did very well. And they, and, they would go, and they would go out in the community, and, and they would, we actually um, would work on what we called a phase system. And my thing was, okay, the community is spending $18,000 for you to be here for six months. That is somebody's college education. What are you going to do to pay back the community? And these kids had never been positively involved in the community. So all of a sudden, they're working on these community service projects, and mayors and people of status are coming up saying, good job. They never had that before. They had never had in authority that told them they did a good job. And I would have these experiences. One kid, because we would go every 30 days to meet the judge, and, and, this, and the judge was like, wow, I'm really proud of you because he was about to graduate. You did a really good job. And this kid, not knowing court etiquette, like lunges over the bench and is like, give it to me there, judge. I'm like, oh, my God, he's going to go back to detention. Like, I'm waiting for the bailiff to jump him. And, and the judge goes, kind of waves the bailiff away, and he was like, good job, and shook his hand. You know, other kids really get involved. So I think there's a way that you can think about less restrictive methods and who really needs to be there. So really thinking about how we structure probation and parole, how we work with it. I gave an example of that. How we plan for continuing school education so they don't have losses. What do we know about suspension and expulsion? You get a kid out of school, they're twice as likely to drop out of high school and three times as likely to be in juvenile justice. This is why DCJS and DOE is partnering to think about trauma-informed schools. We run trauma-informed alternative schools in Delaware. We work in Wilmington which has, we, have, we lose a lot of kids to violence, and we have a 1.7% recidivism rate in alternative schools. They don't come back. We run trauma-informed restorative classrooms. I'll tell you, many of the schools I visit in Virginia, they are warehousing these kids. They're just sitting there. They're not learning anything. They're not building 10,000 hours of self-regulation, positive self-identity, they're warehousing. That's not acceptable, it's not good enough. And there are things that do work, and we need to demand that those things be used. And, and, and I know that, that court service units come to me directly saying, when are you going to, we're trying now to open up some of these schools in Virginia and make that an option. Because some of these day treatment schools, like these private day schools, this is like $24,000, $25,000 a year they're paying to some of these schools. These kids deserve better. They deserve a good education, and we need to get them back to traditional schools um, in a good way, because they deserve to be in their community. So when you're doing a transition, remember transition really kicks up stress, and when stress kicks up, you're more likely to flip your lid, okay, the brain, right? 
one way to remember this is so this is the dog, bow wow owl, which is the amygdala. This is the owl. Okay, so I was explaining this to my seven year old daughter, and uh, she was really stressed out about school because it's SOL time, and all these teachers are like, ooh, and all the kids are like, and there's all these days they've missed out of school. And so she's really stressed out. And she's like, she's like, and I was like, well, do you want to, I, I know the guidance counselor, I'm like, well, do you want to kind of do some mindfulness training for like 15 minutes, like at school, like just some time to relax? And she's like, we're too busy in second grade to take any breaks. And I'm like, oh no. I'm like, that's not good. So I was like, no, we're going to take a break. And this is a therapist child. So we're in the car. And I'm like, I'm going to drive you to school. We're going to practice some relaxation before we get to school. She's like, my dog's barking, mom. My dog's barking. I don't want to go to school. And I'm like, okay, we're going to bring the owl home. We got 15 minutes to relax. So we're driving to school. And I'm like, we're going to make an appointment with the guidance counselor. And she's like, okay, I kind of lose it around 1130. So make that appointment. I'm like, you're such a therapist child. And I was like, okay. And then we're driving. And I was like, okay. So we're relaxing, we're meditating, we're calm. She's like, Mom, that's all good, but some people just make my dog bark all the time. <laughs> She's like, the owl ain't going to come back for certain people at school. And I was like, okay. So yeah, I have people that my dog barks all the time. How do I bring my owl back? So we, and so we kind of practice, and she was able. So then what was hysterical, the end of this story, um, was I called her that night because I was traveling, and I said, so how did it go? She was like, yeah, my guidance counselor got me. I relaxed. I did really good at school today. I taught her that whole dog owl thing. I told her she can use it. She said that was great. I was like, <laughs> I was like okay. <laughs> but my point in that is that kids will get it. I've taught it to teenagers. I've taught it to young children. Adults have a harder time with it. <laughs> um, be, but here's the thing, they will learn. And I've watched teenagers, kids that I worked with in gangs in Newport News, they get it. Staff don't. Remember, times of transition will kick up most violence. Detention centers, when is there the most violence? During food, during movement. Any time of movement, that is when the fight's going to happen. You can watch it, you can bank on it. So it's amazing because when we were in hospitals, our solution to de-escalating kids was when a kid gets really stressed out, we'll scream code yellow across the whole hospital and have 10 big guys walk up on him because of course that makes the child relax. No, it doesn't. It makes them think, how many people can I take out before I get punked and taken to the floor? That's what that does. And that's not healthy. Their fight, fight, or freeze are going. We stopped doing code yellows. We changed a couple of things. We didn't give directions unless we were on eye level, and we had them repeat back the directions. There was a facility that did that, kids with IQ below 70 that were sexually abusive. They made that one change with staff that they could not give a consequence until they made eye contact on the same level and had the child repeat what was being asked of them. Restraints went down by 75% from those two changes. Because kids that have gone through violence, they have looping lags. They have auditory processing disorders. They need to process because, see, they're worried about the threat in the room. They're not paying attention to what's being said to them. And so during times of transition, there was another incident at a, at a residential facility. There was a transition. And so this guy, because we know, actually, when you're, in a, when you're with a kid and things are starting to escalate, their dog's barking, first of all, make sure your dog's not barking. Because if your dog's barking, you're going to set off their dog. They're going to feel it, all right? So second thing is, back up three feet. Don't get up on them. Back up three feet. Lower your voice. Don't increase your voice. It is amazing when I walk through schools, really good schools, the amount of screaming that goes on in a school. We don't do that in our schools in Delaware. We actually do calling techniques. We don't raise our voices because that's a trigger for kids. So they're going through transition. They're going through hygiene. They're trying to move through a lot of this. And um, this kid starts to escalate. The staff member kind of gets ready to use their handle with care for getting all verbal de-escalation skills. They're ready to go down with this kid. And because that's a lot of times only what they've been trained. And so this other kid jumps in front of him and goes, wait, he's not operating from the prefrontal cortex of his brain. <laughs> it's like, you have to help him self-regulate. And then he ran to the psychologist and said, don't you teach your staff this shit? It's really funny really funny. And he was like, yeah, but obviously not very well. <laughs> He's like, so kids will get it. Kids will get it. And they get excited because this is an invisible wound. And kids feel like something's wrong with me. I'm stigmatized. I'm broken. And they go, oh my gosh, it's just my brain was trained this way. I got to train my brain this way. And then we have to help institutions learn how to actually train their brains a different way. There's a great Defending Childhood from Attorney General Eric Colder is excellent. You can get it online. Excellent. It does a whole bunch of points of how we need to change the juvenile justice system, point by point. It's a really good document. 
Um, if our aim is to nurture healthy children within safe communities, we need to change our approach and the values that drive our responses to violence. The reliance on highly punitive approaches is not working. They make people more alienated and angry, they feed cycles of revenge, and as if that is not enough, they are costly. So really, what I tell people is don't react to the behavior, respond to the need. Don't react to setting the fire, respond to the need for control, power, attention, and releasing tension. You respond to the need, don't react to the behavior, you will have more success with the kids that you work with. Educational systems, we know trauma decreases IQ, lowers grade point average, will increase the amount of time they're absent from school, decreases their likelihood they'll graduate from school, and we talked about expulsions and suspensions. Again, you know, what can schools do to report abuse and to get kids services early? Um, this is all in this educator's packet right here, everything I'm saying teaching schools about trauma-informed approaches, bringing in restorative justice practices to schools. I've had teachers who, when I teach them, they just, they cry. One, because a lot of the teachers I meet have a very high ACE score. And so what's happening is a kid is going off and it's triggering them, and they don't know how to handle that. Because when educators went to educate, they thought they would walk in and educate. They had no idea that they had to deal with all this stuff. You know, at least us that go into social work know that we're intentionally working with people that have some behavior problems. Although many of us go into the profession and are like, why are you acting like that? And it's like, because that's why they're seeing you, Allison. <laughs> because that's what they do. <laughs> so, but teachers are shocked. And when teachers get it, they've, I've watched them be very motivated to do something different. But they're not getting this information. So I'm working with a lot. I'm working with uh, Richmond Public Schools on getting involved in their leadership summit. How do we educate? administrators in Richmond Public Schools, I'm talking to someone Friday about Chesterfield, how do we really help educators really think differently about how they educate um, and how they work with kids in their school systems. Um, and I really highly recommend the NCTSN resource guide there. For mental health agencies, phase-oriented care is the evidence-based way to work with kids with trauma. The other thing you have in your packet is from the NCTSN, and it's questions to ask a mental health professional to know if they are qualified to work with someone who has trauma. And I will tell you, I see over and over again, and it makes me, it makes me mad. I mean, we are a service provider. We have a very intensive, um, the folks that work for Family Preservation Services go through about 40 hours of training on trauma and how to work with trauma. That's very important to me. I will tell you that a lot of agencies don't do that, if anything. And so it's not just me as a provider trying to pitch services, it's me as a professional, as a passionate person, saying it is not good enough to have kids working with someone out of their scope of practice. I don't want somebody that's a brain surgeon doing heart surgery on me, okay? I want somebody who's in scope of practice. So you really need to ask that. And so look at those questions. And the other thing is, is that phase-oriented, remember level systems don't work. Those point systems don't work. Point systems require this part of the brain to be active. Most of our kids are down here, okay? So this part of the brain, what works is connect. Connection works here. Being connected to someone else and being self-regulated. What, once you get this part of the brain to come back, the owl flies back, then you can redirect. Then consequences and other things work. But if they're not there, you gotta work down here to work with where the brain is. And so that's what safety and stabilization is about, is first, if they're in active abuse now, of course you're not gonna lower their threat response. They're trying to protect themselves. Um, but we do a lot of what we call dialectical behavior therapy, um, informed therapy. So we teach a lot on distress tolerance skills. You have a handout on distress tolerance skills in your packet. We do a lot of what they call stress inoculation. So many of us, there's a document in there called Vulnerability Mountain. So here's the idea. So how many people here slept more than six hours last night? Yay. How many people slept more than eight hours last night? One, yay. All right, how many people slept less than six hours last night? A lot, okay. So here's the thing, the dog is the amygdala. Up here, the hippocampus helps us calm down. When you sleep less than six hours, remember I said axons and dendrites? Dendrites kind of die, hippocampus makes you learn to her memory. So when you sleep less than six hours, your brain can't process everything that happened the day before correctly. What also happens is you can't go into REM sleep. REM sleep is kind of like the computer virus and defrag. Anybody ever had the blue screen of death? I have. So my di computer dies, and the first thing they ask you is, have you been doing virus scan? Have you been defragging? OK, that's what REM sleep is. So please try to sleep. The last thing in this packet is a self-care inventory list. And people go, oh, yeah, that's nice. And then they read everything else, right? So I would really encourage you to think about yourself for now. Because trauma-informed care is about children, 
adults, caregivers, and us, the providers of care. So at the top of here, we have self-regulation skills, this mountain, imagine up here. Depending on how much I've slept and how much I'm taking care of myself and all those things, I'm gonna be in a different place. Zero is most relaxed I've ever been, 10 is the most stressed. If I start my day at an eight, probably not gonna do as great of a job, okay? I started at three, so then I come down and I hit stress. So I hit my caseload and computer problems and um, people yelling at me and, you know, increased, you know, crazy policies that the General Assembly makes and new regulations that we have to go through, all this stuff. And I quickly slide from down vulnerability mountain and I start thinking very negative cognition. So I start thinking, why did I get this a profession? Why didn't I pick a profession that went into money? Why did I work with people? I could have worked with widgets. It was much easier. And then we're slowly down into the valley of distress. And that's when we're down here. Fight, flight, or freeze. I'm sure no one here has ever felt that way. So, but all of us go up and down vulnerability mountain into the valley of distress. We have to have behavioral health interventions at every level. So at the top of the hill, we have to be teaching self-regulation skills and how to take care of themselves, replacement coping behaviors, like I did in the beginning with the, with the fire example. We have to be teaching them how to deal with stress, how to change the way they think about the things happening to them. Because what happens is when you've been a victim, it feels like you have no power and everything's happening to you. And sometimes when you're involved in the system, that's exactly what's happening. And so it reaffirms our life experience. And then we get to the bottom, fight, flight, or freeze, and that's when we teach distress tolerance still, like the accepts model. And we have to teach skills. So the safety and stabilization phase is really teaching them replacement coping behaviors. And once we can do a lot of that, then and only then can we go into their trauma narrative. Because if you actually go into their trauma narrative up front, it can be re-traumatizing. What I say to people is when you meet with somebody and you're asking questions about trauma, ask for the chapter titles, not the book contents. So give me your top five bad, your top five good. Don't give the details because it's re-traumatizing. Now that's tough because in some cases if we're court involved, we've got to get the details. But if you've got to get the details, really be working with somebody that knows how to do forensic work that's trauma informed because we can really re-traumatize somebody. And then finally, reintegration. So the skills that they learn, we reprocess the trauma, we make it not as triggering to them, but they're also gonna need these skills for future stress in life. Um, and that's what we've done. Um, I'm happy to talk to anybody about AIM4. For the last two years, I've been writing a model based on the NCTSN and based on all the research we have about what works with trauma. And um, we base it on the work we're doing with the National Council, and it's a very trauma-informed model of how we work with kids and families. So I'm happy to talk about that. The reason I bring that up is, Again, for your profession, the NCTSN will have a guide. So think about you or Oz, what are you gonna do differently? What are you gonna start doing after today? What are you gonna stop doing after today? And what are you gonna do more of? Child welfare agencies are, are no different. So I talked about how we're working with some of the agencies to think about the child welfare toolkit. Um, I'm doing a lot of training in that area right now. Um, remembering that traumatized parents are not bad. It's very hard when I used to sit and work with sexually abusive youth and they would tell me the things that they'd done to their victim, of course I was pissed. I don't like that. I didn't like what they did. But that, w that was their behavior. I had to have a connection with them to try to help them get healthier. And so a lot of times CPS workers get so overwhelmed with parents and they just see them as bad. And that can happen to us too. Because you get really angry. Just remember, be angry at the behavior and then try to understand the need. Because the best shot for that kid is if we help the parent. And if the parent can't be helped and it continues to be abusive, then of course we need to protect that child. But many of the parents can be helped. Um, and build on motivation. Resource families, again, there are guides for that. Um, I've kind of talked about some of this, is just realizing that I've talked about fight, flight, or freeze in a person. We have fight, flight, or freeze in our system of care. I mean, how many meetings have you been in where departments are fighting with each other? Or running from each other? No, I didn't see that person. I'm going to skip out over here. Right? Or a committee meeting where people just freeze. They're like, I just want it to be over. I'm not going to say anything. Or you don't answer certain emails. Or you avoid certain phone calls. We have fight, flight, or freeze in our very system of care. And the truth is, human service professionals, which is us, all of us in the system, it is likely that we're not just 70%. Our ACE scores are light, higher, a lot to be, uh, are more likely to be higher. Okay? It's just a fact. So if you're in a supervisory role, think about the fact that your workers may have an ACE score that they've never talked about, never disclosed. And if you do have a higher ACE score and you're feeling stressed, take care of yourself. 
Think about how you're going to get trauma-informed care. Okay? I'll give you an example. I have an ACE score of 8. By the time I was 19, I'd been hospitalized 10 times, and I had nurses that told me I was a frequent flyer and should never be left out of a hospital setting, ever. I'm a childhood sexual abuse survivor and a domestic violence survivor. And I got some really lousy care as a kid. You know? And I had a lot of people that told me I wasn't going to make it. But I had one mental health technician, one, who told me that he thought that I could be different. He thought that I could make it. And he would sneak literature to me and books to me and say, just try to make it out of your family. Your life's going to be different. Go to college. You're smart. And he would encourage me. And I went to college, and I started figuring stuff out. And I researched what worked with trauma. And then I started getting better at knowing what kind of providers I wanted for care. And then I wanted to pay it forward. Because my kids are recovering from trauma of their own. I have three girls. But today, I'm not, and, and my story's not unique. But what's important is my outcome's not unique either. There are so many kids and families that would make it. So many. So many that make it anyway. I was in a case the other day. This kid has had a five-month-old brother die, a 12-year-old brother murdered. Her father is in prison. Her mother has an ACE score of eight. And she's in trouble and on a chins because she is arguing with teachers at school. And I'm thinking, like, oh, my gosh, how amazing is that kid? That's all? She's arguing with some teachers? But she's about to get in a whole lot of trouble at school. And she's had multiple mental health providers, none of them trained in trauma. And she thinks it's her fault. She thinks she's a bad kid. And so I think it's important to know that your workers may have ACE scores and need to process it. And to also, one judge said to me, because I have a poem I usually share, but I forgot to bring it today, but I share my story. And I had a judge from Hampton come up and tell me. It was very touching. He said, you know what you helped me remember? He said, when I look at kids, I just want them to make it. I just want them not to come back. But you helped me remember that kids will not only not come back, they will contribute and make this community better. And that's right. And there are many of us who have ACE scores sitting in here now who are making our communities better. And the kids we work with will too. They just got to have the right type of care. So um, again, the things that we experience in systems, um, all those adversarial relationships, um, that um, creates that whole emotional chain of custody. Kids feel it. I say kids and families have what they call trauma gar. They can feel it. They know. It's very interesting. The brain can't tell the difference between a bear and you losing your car keys. So what does that mean? Anybody here ever lost their car keys and they're looking everywhere frantically and you can't find them? And then someone else walks in and goes, oh, they're right here. Why? There's a part of the brain called the occipital lobe, and when you get stressed, your brain is looking for a bear. It doesn't see keys because why would you be afraid of keys? <laughs> You're looking for the bear. This is why kids have visual processing and auditory processing difficulties, because our brain can't tell the difference. So we have to help people kind of, one, put in perspective of, it's keys, calm down. <laughs> it's not a bear. But we have kids that everything feels like a bear. And we have professionals that everything is a bear. That dog's barking really loud. And so kids can feel that stress from you, and they immediately go into fight, fight, or freeze. And they think it's them. They think they've done something. It's their fault. So one of the things I do with a lot of my clinicians, because we all have cases that we know we get triggered by. You know, I had, I had one particular mom. I have time for this story, and then I'm going to questions. Um, I had this one particular mom. So in this family, I worked with 20 members of the family, four generations of incest. Um, I was doing an in-home case, and I would go in and work with the paternal grandmother. I got the seven- and nine-year-old who'd become sexually reactive with each other. I'm working with grandma to figure out all this stuff. Grandma would be psyched after our sessions. I'd be like, yeah, made a difference. We'd come back. She wouldn't have done anything I asked her to do. And I kept scratching my head going, what's that about? So one day I asked her, I said, so it feels like we're doing really good work together, and then I leave, and then you don't do anything we talked about. And she was like, oh yeah, every time you leave, I call my son in prison, and he says you're full of shit. So I don't do what you say. I was like, oh, maybe I should talk to him. <laughs> so I had the whole family go to prison, and we talked to dad. Because shame on me that I didn't think dad was important because he was in prison. Shame on me. And I talked to Dad, and he's like, well, look, what I'm mad about is, can't you just wait five months? I'm going to be out in five months. Can't you just wait on five months and just hold my kids because I want to be there? And I said, your kids are having sex with each other, and they're about to be taken by Child Protective Services. You were in foster care. 
do you really want me to wait? And this big tough guy kind of teared up and said, yeah, that was kind of messed up what I've been doing. No, tell me what I got to do. I got him to buy in. He encouraged his mom to pay attention. Things started getting better. You know? So, but I dealt with, I also dealt with the other grandmother in that family whose son, um, who had sexually abused a nephew, and she was a very scary lady. So she would scream and yell at me to the point that I would cry. I would just start to cry. And, and I, so I went to my clinical supervisor and I said, I really don't think I can handle this case. Give it to someone else. I'll pay someone else to take this case. Anybody take this grandma but me. And so he's like, no, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go in and be vulnerable with her. And I was like, okay, so I'm going to show blood to a shark. Great. And I was like, okay, I'll do it because I'm going to prove you wrong. I was a very young therapist. So I went in, and so I knew that Grandma was going to yell at me before long. So 16-year-old son was sitting there. So she gets ready to yell at me at all the things I'm doing wrong. And instead of trying to defend myself, I said, you know, when you say those things, it really hurts. Like, I'm trying to understand why you need to hurt me because I'm really trying to be helpful. And the 16-year-old jumped in, and he said, Ma, that's what it's like. Everywhere we go, the teachers hide under desks. The principal pretends he's in a meeting. Like, everyone's scared of you, Mom. They don't see what I see. You scare people. And she looked at me. She's like, Allison, I don't scare you. And I'm like, I am fucking petrified. I'm like, I am so scared of you. She's like, are you kidding me? And so then we had a conversation. She really didn't know she was scary. Because no one had ever told her because she was too scary. Nobody ever told her she was scary. They just avoided her. And so then I heard her story. This was a woman who at four years old laid in a bed while her mother served John's. And many of the Johns had sex with her. This mom had been through some unbelievable things, this grandma. And I sat and got to know her in a different way. I would have quit on her. I would not have asked that question. So I think what's important is when we think about all this in the chain of custody, we've really got to get in there and think about how to take care of ourselves and how to use some of this stuff to do a better job. Um, I've talked a little bit about the Greater Richmond Community Network. These are types of things that we do. Um, domain six work is stakeholder work. So what are you going to do when you leave here to um, take this information I've shared today? We're identifying service gaps. One of the things that we're trying to come up with is a provider service book so people know what scope of practice is and what different people are doing. We're trying to work with the colleges to better pre pre um, prepare human service professionals as they graduate, think about how we communicate, think about how we change screening and assessment type of groups, um, kind of think about how we do case planning, what are tools we can train DSS and different types of caseworkers in, and how can we create more and more education and training resources, how can we pull a group together of trainers like myself, there's several of us that go out and try to train in the community. I know for our company, um, Family Preservation Services is part of the Providence Service Corporation. We work in 41 states in Canada. We have about 11,000 workers in our company and serve about 18 million consumers across the country. One of the things we're doing as part of this is on September 12th, we're having a National Day of Service where we're paying our 11,000 employees to go out and do something for their community, be involved in their community, give back. Virginia, we've decided to dedicate September to care. So we're going to be reaching out to partners in the Richmond community. We have 30 offices across the state, across the state of Virginia, thinking what can we do to raise awareness on September 12th for trauma-informed care. We're starting to be planning. If you're interested, please write me. We're really trying to think about how we can make that day really powerful. But all agencies can think how to do that. Um, those are some of the things. And these are the types of folks that sit on the TICN. Um, criminal Justice, Department of Education, Juvenile Domestic Relation Courts, Child Advocacy, Local Schools, School Administration, um, these are different kinds of people that we want to educate as well as sit on the TICN. So, again, what I really care about is 10% is what I've talked about. 90% is what are you going to do? You know, what are you already doing that you're going to do more of? Um, what is something that you may think about stop doing? And what might you want to start? How do you want to do, do more? Because that's what I really care about. I'm a rubber hits the road kind of girl, and I care about making trauma-informed communities. Um, because I speak for families and kids just like mine. And I know that if we invest, we can do some different things. So um, I just want to put it out there for questions, questions people have of me. Yes. Yes, it's you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, they do. Yeah. 
I used to have staff in practical films that would be like, X, I got you, and they would, yeah, put their point system up. That's right. So very interesting. Two things I'll share. One, on the NCTSN, they have an entire training for juvenile detention workers about how you can change your detention facilities to be trauma-informed juvenile detention facilities. And it's free training. It's all free. So I would say that's one option, is to talk to some of the administrators and really think about, guess what? You can achieve safety and be trauma-informed. For example, with restorative justice in schools, some schools think, well, we can't achieve safety, we've got a no tolerance policy, and I'm like, guess what, no tolerance makes no sense. We're actually not making schools safer. There are ways to do this. So there are ways to set up juvenile detention. A lot of it is about starting to educate them. I know Lynn Edwards on our trauma-informed community network has started to do some things in correctional facilities of training and has been asked in by the Department of Juvenile Justice. So I could certainly connect you with her or ask. The other thing is I think there's this really cool organization I've just learned about. It's called Strategies for Youth. Yeah, you know them? Okay, all right, they're really cool. So I've been talking to Lisa and them. I just did a presentation down in Virginia Beach. They're gonna be the first pilot area. Yes, yes, so, yeah, and so our folks are gonna do some help. But what's interesting about Strategies for Youth is their whole mission is to improve relationships between police officers and youth in the community and change that. And it's very trauma-informed. The same thing needs to happen with correctional officers. Um, is that they need to understand there's a different way. Many of them don't get trained in development. They think, and again, I used to work with military and do TRICARE private practice, and one of the dads used to say, okay, so Allison, I go to work, and in one word, 118 year olds will snap their feet and do anything I say. And then I come home, and my teenager is in my face telling me to bleep, 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 bleep. And you're telling me to do what? Hug a thug? Hell no. They're like, you know what I mean? Because that's, that's the thing, is I don't understand. Like, you know, and what I'm saying is, so what we did is we changed the mindset. The first question I ask is, is what you're doing working? No. Okay, well, if it's not working, then perhaps we should explore something else. So even if you don't think it's going to work, what if we try it? And then we get them talking to other detention facilities. Some detention facilities, they focus heavily on self-regulation skills, because guess what? If kids are regulated, they don't fight. I've been in riots with kids building shanks. I'd much rather have them regulated, you know? And so one of the things they did is they actually had them decorate their rooms and they had coping boxes and all this stuff. And one of the detention workers in this training raised their hand and said, aren't they going to forget they're in detention? And I said, I'm pretty sure a kid remembers they're in detention. Pretty sure. But that's the fear, that if these kids aren't afraid, they're not going to obey. What they need to understand is with the brain, all you're doing is identifying with the abuser. You're not going to make them more afraid.